Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, citizens of the planet Earth, welcome to Club Cosmos! Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wilson the Silver, and I'm the editor of Cosmos, which, as I'm sure you know, is Australia's number one science magazine. And I will be your host tonight for our uh, Siri penetrating. And uh, let's face it, sometimes, occasionally risque discussion of science. Uh, tonight's provocative question is, what have animals ever done for us? Do we even need animals? Are they a bit passe for a global species that can actually change the climate of the planet? And what's all this biodiversity stuff anyway? So to tackle this, we have assembled a distinguished panel of experts who, thanks to the magic of the pub setting and the liberating effects of alcohol, will tell you all you need to know about this essential topic. And as the night wears on, they will probably tell you some things they didn't know they knew. Let me introduce my guests. Starting, starting at the far right, and I don't mean as a political judgment, is Sarah Mansfield, who's a former research entomologist with the Forest Research, the Forest Research at Rotorua, New Zealand, and a postdoctoral fellow with CSIRO Entomology. She has been a senior lecturer in agriculture and entomology from the Faculty of Agriculture, Food and Natural Resources at the University of Sydney since 2005, which is actually when Cosmos launched. There you go. With a particular interest in insect parasitoids. These apparently larva which feed on living tissue. Wow, you must be fun at parties. Particularly dinner parties, I think. Um, as well as predatory ecology and behaviour. So she can use them to control, you know, agricultural pests. Sarah coordinates all units of study in agricultural entomology at the University of Sydney. Her research organisms of choice include egg parasitoids of uh, Lepidoptera and Coleoptera, ladybirds and predatory bugs. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sarah Mansfield! Now to her left, at my not so extreme right, is Brendan Burns, who's a microbiologist at the University of New South Wales. A winner of the 2005 Eureka Prize for Interdisciplinary Scientific Research, Brendan heads up an astrobiology, astrobiology research group at the University of New South Wales, and is considered to be a world leader in the study of modern stromatolites. These are kind of living rocks that are sitting out uh, off Western Australia and once used to cover the Earth, which he hopes um, will provide insights into the early life on our planet. Uh, Brendan's research crosses fields ranging from microbiology, functional genomics, and biotechnology, plus the physical sciences of geology and paleontology. Please welcome Brendan Burns! <laughs> and last but not least, uh, to my immediate right, is uh, Dieter Hochley. Is that the correct pronunciation? You can go with Bochwoli or... Bochwoli? 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 Studies the ecology of terrestrial insects and their interaction with plants and the work in his lab has three central themes. They are insect-plant relations, or interactions. Relations probably is pretty relations. Good, isn't it? Um, community ecology and conservation biology. He's a senior lecturer from the School of Biological Sciences, also at the University of Sydney, and uh, was awarded the 2010 Vice-Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Research, Higher uh, Degree Supervision. An aficionado of rare books, uh, he also curated the Rare Books and Special Collections exhibition at the Fisher Library in 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, Dieter Hockley! <laughs> Officially! Officially! <laughs> Must make it sound like um, you're in a band. Now listen, um, guys, I've got to ask you. Biodiversity. What? What? WTF? Like, do we actually need animals? This is the, the, the question we have. Is there any reason for us to need the animal world. Let me ask you first, Dieter. What, what have the animals ever done for us? Well, they basically keep the bunch, the processes that keep life going, going. They um, pollinate plants, they move nutrients around, they eat animals that we don't necessarily want. So, overwhelmingly, they do stuff that's important to the, basically the, 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 the functioning of natural ecosystems. Having said that, a lot of animals probably don't do a great deal for us at all. Some of them aren't particularly useful at all, but... Aha! There you go, you're admitting it. You're admitting it. We're not getting our value for animals. I mean, agreed, we don't pay them anything, right? Well, they're not useful. So free labor. I'll just flag, they're not useful, but they're still good. There's a lot of things in the world that aren't useful, but we still like them. Like such as? Art, music. Okay. Oh. 
This one, right. is it useful? Do we like it? Tony Abbott, okay, yeah. And that, well, he's not useful, said it. Like said it. It. But, you know, is, would you agree with this, Sarah? Are they yeah, Nature sure. pay, pays, its, pays its way, does it? I think it does. Uh, we depend on it for our food. Here's some animal right here. Slightly adulterated, of course, and cooked, but much of our food, if it isn't, uh, comes from animals. Much of our clothing. Anyone wearing wool tonight? Anyone wearing wool tonight? Put your hands up. Or silk. There you go. Leather. Yes. Leather. So, leather. What you do with the privacy of your own home is... Yeah, exactly. But it, privacy is an issue. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and leather's good. Leather, yeah. Okay, so outside of food and outside of occasional clothes, what else do they do? You, you were harking on about something to do with um, pollinating. Well, mate, a lot of a lot of plants basically use insects as, as flying genitals. They get them to move their bits from, <laughs> from from one plant to another. It's the way that plants get to move around, move their genes around, basically. And they can't rely ones don't rely on wind like a lot of insects and birds in particular. They basically visit the flowers, move move the pollen around, and you end up with um outbreeding. You end up with that those basic um. Jesus, that vision is just flying <laughs> genitals. Yeah. Um, they're traveling flying um, genitals. So you're saying basically they don't have sex organs. And they don't have ways of promulgating their well, seeds. They can't, they can't move their sex. We, we can move our sex organs around to where we want to distribute them, but a lot of um, you know, plants can't. So plants being pretty much the foundation of life on the planet means that... Um, well, plants being the foundation of life on the planet means that um, they need these animals to move their, their genes around. So basically, yeah, flying genitals, that's one of the really useful things they do. <laughs> Sounds like a good movie, I think. I've, I've learned something, um, Brendan. I don't know about you. Um, so... Is this essential? Uh, you're, you're a bit of an expert at agriculture, Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, is pollination, we kind of rely on that, do we? Absolutely. It's essential to most of our food production. Look at if you like blueberries or many of the other stone fruits, just for all, all our food requires insects to produce or set the fruit. Uh, and so yeah. which insects are particularly useful? The honeybee. Really? One species does almost all of our pollination for agriculture. Wow, really? Yep. So we're a little bit reliant on that. Hugely reliant. So if they went on strike, we're in trouble. Yes, we would be. Uh, yeah. So we'd run what out sort of percentages would you know? So honeybees, would you, are, they, are they like 10% or are we talking like really more than 50? Um, in terms of pollination, then yeah. that'd be near to 100%, I believe. Really? Okay, well, I feel really guilty about, you know. Not native trees, of course. Native trees are different, but for agricultural pollination, you are almost entirely reliant on the honeybee. Okay, so... Okay. Okay. I have an interesting uh, anecdote to the bees, though. I'm not working in the insect industry. But um, there's a study, a group in, at Macquarie University, actually looking at the effects of cocaine on the honeybees. And they were looking at um, neural they, pathways. And they found that bees react in the same way as the human to cocaine. And I was quite amused by that. I didn't know if that meant that they then went to rave parties and, and you know, <laughs> started you know, boosting cars and things like that. But it, <clears throat> it's amazing, and again, not being an insect, insects, this is using insects to identify the effects of drugs on neural pathways and then using that as analogues to, to what's happening in the human situation. So that's actually quite interesting. So, that's apart from agriculture. What would be interesting though is would they work harder at pollinating? Possibly, because you know everyone right, in agriculture, Sarah, come on, they're always looking for that extra that two to three percent gain. No, I think it might affect their um, ability to find their way to and from the hive, though. Don't you think? It could be. They'd be jacking, jacking cows, jacking cows instead, of, <laughs> instead, of, <laughs> instead of pollinating. Okay, so pollination is pretty important. I uh, wasn't aware of that. So outside of that, you guys are both entomologists, Sarah and uh, DJ. You're both entomologists. So are you telling us that insects actually perform a role? about which we should be somewhat thankful. What are we saying, Peter? Well, well, basically, when you consider that plants are the foundation of life on the planet, you know, they're the, you know, the organs that are producing our oxygen, yeah, I mean, they're based, a lot of plants rely on insects visiting, and, and, and a lot of birds as well, so the short answer is, yeah, yeah, a lot of animals do a lot of really good things for us. Um, I mean, insects do a lot, or animals do a lot of other things too. I should also flag with the insects thing, we'll focus, I mean, we'll, we'll, Sarah and I will probably focus on insects, because they're basically, as many of you know, they're, they're the little things that run the world. We could lose pretty much most of the world's mammals and the world would pretty much keep going as is. we lost the insects that have collapsed in a screaming heap within years. So, right. yeah, so I'm mean, just returning to a point from before this. There are some animals that I think aren't particularly useful. We could lose them in terms of the, your question about what have they done for us. And they don't, 
some of them don't really do a great job. It doesn't mean that they're not important, but it means that some things, I think one of the points I'd, I'd like to make is that some things aren't particularly useful. Some bits of biodiversity don't provide useful services to the community. Useful, but but maybe not that. Exactly. Maybe not, it's not the point that they're meant to be useful for us. It's maybe we're looking at it at, in an anthropogenic way. We're trying to find things that are useful for us, whereas that's not really the point. They're here on this but isn't ecology for, like a web of life and all that sort of thing? So if you take one bit out of it, it sort of has an impact somewhere else down the chain? Oh, there's definitely a web, but there's a lot of inbuilt redundancy in that web. There's a lot of things where if you lose one particular species, given the way that competition structures the natural world, you lose one of those species, another animal will move in and take that role and provide that role. It doesn't work for a lot of things like pollination and some other services, but basically, um, yeah, if you, again, with respect to the usefulness, I think you'll find that the web of life part of it's important. There's a bit of evidence that the complexity of those webs adds to their stability, but um, Essentially, there's probably a fair bit of inbuilt redundancy in nature. Nature will keep functioning if we lose certain bits and pieces. Well, from what Sarah's saying, it sounds like the, uh, the bees have cornered the market when it comes to pollination. They dominate the, the world market on pollination, do they? Yeah, in terms of agricultural production, the, the, they are, the honeybee is almost our entire focus for commercial pollination. Uh, there are other species that produce a small amount of pollination. Bumblebees are used in certain situations, although not here in Australia. But bumblebees are used for particularly tomato pollination in glasshouses. Uh, and it's because honeybees don't like to work inside a glasshouse. They'll pollinate your tomatoes fine outside in a field, but they don't like being inside. So they do use bumblebees for other things. And there are native insects, native bees that provide pollination. But if you want pollination on time, if you need lots and lots of workers in a set period of time, it's got to be the honeybee. The honeybees are domesticated, they're, you can handle them fairly easily, and they're really the only bee species that produces that volume of workers, that size of hive that can pollinate hectare after hectare of almonds or blueberries or tomatoes or corn or whatever it is that you need to pollinate. Nothing else can provide those numbers. Just on that note, that's one, one species of bee that's important. What about, how many species of bees would you say there are on the planet? In total, I don't know, but Australia has a huge number of native bees. I think it has more than a thousand native bee species. A thousand? Yeah. And, wow. And how many, how many of them would play an important role, do you think, for those sort of, I mean, I mean for commercial, for our food production, you'd probably guess that it'd be a couple, maybe? Yeah, two, yeah, two or three. Out of that thousand. Say. Um, Guys, I'm going to lean into your microphones so and make sure you're here. Everyone's hearing my booming voice, but they're not hearing you. And you guys are the talent of this end of business. Um, so that's, we're kind of reliant on the bees then um, for agricultural production. Uh, luckily, there's nothing bad happening to them, is there? Guys? Uh, I wish that were true. So what, you, you, you tell us about this, uh, this disease that's breaking out there and why the bees are going so silent. Well, Australia is now the only continent that doesn't have varroa mite, and that's an insect, well, sorry, a mite rather, related to insects, but not actually an insect, and it feeds on the workers, it attaches to the workers, and... But the worker bees, you The worker bees, yes. And not the, the blue collar workers, yeah. No, <laughs> well, you know, the blue, blue collar workers of the insect world, yes, <laughs> but not the humans, uh, and that is devastating. It's cause huge problems uh, all over the world. And what happens once Varroa has arrived is it means all the wild colonies of bees, the feral colonies that are not managed by humans disappear. And so they no longer can provide that free pollination service. If you want pollination, you must go to a commercial beekeeper. You've got to pay for their services. And it's much more expensive because the beekeeper now has to control that Varroa mite and spend money on controlling that and keeping his bees healthy. So that's before it was considered um, this growing concept in, um, in, in the now that he's even reaching the world of economics where they've actually got to factor in things like ecological services provided by nature which previously had no value apparently for economists. But apparently they do have a value because when they go we, we notice them. Yeah, well, I think pollination just in the United States alone is estimated as something like three billion per year in value. That the total contribution of insects to the economy of the United States was, in a recent paper, estimated at over 50 billion per year. There you go. And I bet you they don't get bonuses either, if they do a really good job. Wow. Um, now, the, the other, we have two entomologists here, but we also have 
a microbiologist. And um, I guess the, we, we, we might not take for granted insects, but the other thing we probably take for granted is um, probably bacteria. And most bacteria we want to kill, don't we, yeah. Brendan? A lot of people have that impression exactly that every, everything that is small and tiny that we can't see, we want to get rid of. Because there are a lot that cause disease, we're all aware of those, you can see it in the news a lot. But there's a lot of bacteria that are very useful. In fact, as with insects, if we didn't have microorganisms, the world as we know would cease to exist. Entirely. Right, so what kind of things do they do? So us, give us a, a quick rundown to, before we start using that uh, antibiotic bleach or you know, using, making everything, um, uh, that stuff that kills the back, back to antibacterials. So you're using antibacterials and everything. Beer. Yes. Beer? Oh my god, are you kidding me? It's only bacteria making beer. This is by a microorganism, yeast that ferments beer, bread, a lot of food um, substances are made by microorganisms. Um, you have a lot of very useful um, microorganisms in your gut, so they actually break down um, products that you eat that you, the humans don't have enzymes that break down certain products that bacteria do. So can actually break down these by the microorganisms. In fact, we wouldn't be able to process most food, would we? Exactly. Yeah, Without you have these... The bacteria and, we have. And this is this whole idea of, in some yogurts, having these kinds of commensal organisms that can, can help out. That's at a, a medical point of view. From an environmental point of view, a lot of microorganisms involved in cycling nutrients throughout the environment, bioremediation. I have some of them in my fridge. You probably do, yes. You, you, you chuck an organism um, on a oil spill that BP may have done in the in the Gulf and, and, that, will, and that will degrade the oil and the benzene there because they can break it down whereas um, at, at a much more economical way. So one is processing food in our gut, yep. one is uh, services that we need before we even get food and the other one is um, actually something, something we take for granted which is decay. I mean if things didn't oh, decay, absolutely. gosh, yeah, be that is sort of hanging around like, well even a bad yeah. smell. We you wouldn't be that smell. <laughs> Other things such as antibiotics, bacteria produce antibiotics, so that everything that we're using in, in medicine is produced by bacteria. Having said that, if you start using that to too much of an extent, you're going to make these bacteria resistant to all these antibiotics to eventually have a super bug that will wipe us all out. So that's a bit of a downside to it. That's one of the problems isn't it, with the antibiotics is that when you take them, they're kind of a sh like walking into a bar with a shotgun and just shooting everything. Exactly. It's in there. So you're actually doing the good stuff, aren't you? You are, yeah, absolutely. Particularly if people that take a lot, they're, they're killing the, the very good organisms in the gut. So people that have shown that they've taken too many antibiotics, that they, they have to need to supplement that with other vitamins and things like that because they don't have the, the gut microflora that can take, that can... I was hoping, that. ladies and gentlemen, that we'd come up with a list of useful species that we could keep. But it looks like that this keeps growing. So uh, I think we're going to have to, we're going to have to take a break. Uh, we're coming up to our first break now, and and uh, you're welcome to order your drinks and go to the bathroom. But I, as I promised, um, we would ask a trivia question in the first break. And the trivia question, which you can, you've got pens in there, and you can write your answer. Uh, and this is to go into the draw for me that prize. The question is: the remora fish. So first, I give you some data, and then you've got to answer the questions. It's multiple choice. The remora fish attaches to the side of a shark and feeds on scraps. Is this A, commensalism, B, parasitism, C, mutualism, or D, just plain wrong? <laughs> so I'll run through that again. A, commensalism, B, parasitism, C, Mutualism, or D, just plain wrong. So we're going to take a break and we'll be back in 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Give us a little bit of a round of applause for finishing off. Thank you.